Good morning. Welcome to all of Mennonite Church outside and online. Uh, we are excited that you are here with us this morning. Whether you are here with us live uh, at our gathering uh, or whether you're joining us online, however, whenever, wherever, we are glad that you are here with us uh, for this time of worship. If you're a guest, we invite you to head over to our Facebook page and drop us a note. Let us know that you're here. Uh, if you're a guest that's live with us, we would love to uh, meet up with you as well and, and uh, make sure you get connected and, uh, and say hi to some people. We again have this wonderful opportunity to gather together in this beautiful setting, uh, and we, th we are thankful for this space to hear uh, God's people chattering and, and talking among each other is just such a wonderful noise. It's a wonderful sound. We know that there is still much healing to happen in our county, in our country, in the world, and with that, we know that God also has not hit the pause button. He continues to work in all things, both in our communities as well as, as in our hearts, preparing us for the next steps that he has for us. He is ready. He's continually giving us opportunities to open our hearts to one step at a time following his lead to bring healing, not only physically to one another, but emotionally, spiritually, relationally, God is good and God is at work. As we enter into our time of worship together, let us pause and center our hearts and ready ourselves to hear what God has in store for us so, so we may take a step deeper into his living for his purpose and that our steps when we leave this place today may help others come to know him as well. Would you pray with us? God, we thank you for this space. We thank you that we can come together as a congregation, whether we're sitting here live or whether we're joining online. God, we just thank you for, for everyone in this space. You are so good. You are so kind and loving. And God, we open our hearts to you today. That as we worship through song and prayer and scripture and, and message that our hearts will absorb and hear what you need us to hear, that we may grow a bit deeper in love with who you are and a bit deeper into our understanding of what that means for us as we head out into our community this week. God, we are thankful that you are present with us, and it's to you that we give honor and glory this morning. Amen. Would you join us in song?
want to hear from all of you because I don't know if if all of you can hear each other sing, but I can't hear anybody sing because our song of praise is going right straight up. So any of you that are blessed by being able to get together and praise God together, shout a big amen on three. One, two, three. Amen. amen. Yeah. <laughs> okay. You're really blessed, Merlin. I'm so happy for you. <laughs> Scripture today is Mark 15, and I'm reading verses 21 through 41. It's so the crucifixion of Jesus. A certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing on his way in from the country and they forced him to carry the cross. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. Then they offered him wine mixed with, with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him. Dividing up his clothes, they cast lots to see what each would get. It was nine in the morning when they crucified him. The written notice of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. They crucified two rebels with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, So, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, come down from the cross and save yourself. In the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the law mocked him among themselves. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. Let this Messiah, this King of Israel, come down from the cross that we may see and believe. Those crucified with him also heaped insults on him. At noon, Darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabbatani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing near heard this, they said, Listen, he's calling Elijah. Someone ran, filled a sponge with wine vinegar, put it on a staff, and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down, he said. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, Surely this man was the Son of God. Some women were watching from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James, the younger, and of Joseph, and Solomon. In Galilee, these women had followed him and cared for his needs. Many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem were also there.
Jason. Join with me as we pray over Jason. Dear Lord God, I thank you so much for the opportunity for this congregation to praise you, to gather, to sing together, to join in worship for all that you have done for us and in generations before us. Lord, help our hearts be touched by your words as Jason leads us through these chapters. And Lord, I pray your presence over him as you give him the words to share with us this morning. All these things I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Today we are in week 10 of the study of the Gospel of Mark. A book written by John Mark, who was a friend, uh, mentee, and uh, missionary partner with Peter. And who wrote these accounts of the Apostle Simon Peter in the Gospel of Mark. As Peter would tell these stories to him one last time. As we jump into today's scripture in Mark chapters 14 and 15, I want you to, as, as we look at this story, as you read this story, to not read it as if you're reading the Bible, but read it as if you're sitting with Peter, along with Mark in this room as Peter recalls this story of following Jesus. And let Peter's reflection and emotion come through as you read this book of Mark as a whole, but most certainly for today. Last week, we saw a big parade for Jesus. As the crowds grew and gathered, the closer that he got to Jerusalem. And then we see Jesus navigate through several special or through several events and debates as as uh, he upsets the temple both physically and as he outdebated and outmaneuvered and 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 made the religious leaders and temple leadership angry. While at the same time those he left those who were watching and listening amazed at what he was saying at his teachings. And we ended last week with Jesus in great detail laying out what the destruction of the temple might look like as he knew what he was about to go through in the coming days would finalize the covenant of the Hebrew scriptures. And as he finalized this old covenant, as he would he would seal in place a new covenant, a better one, a more simple one. One that would be simple but would yet require so much more for those who followed his lead. As they lead with love above all other things. Today we move into Mark chapters 14 and 15. And a hard move it is as as Peter details the last days of Jesus' life. As Peter shares insights that that they didn't understand at the time as they were going through these events. Even to the place of his own regrettable actions. Peter could have left some of his story out. Maybe I would have. Mark may have even asked him if he really wanted to share some of these details that 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 we're going to get into today. I certainly have have areas in my life that... uh, I wouldn't want to necessarily share to the masses, but Peter does. So why does Peter tell us? He tells us so that we can know that even in the darkest hour, when Peter drifted away, Jesus continued to do what he had to do for him. Even when Peter lost his faith, even when you lose your faith, Even when I lose my faith, 
Jesus creates a way back. And he continued to do for Peter what he needed to do to get him back. And he continues to do for us what he needs to do to get us back. You are never too far away from the kingdom of God to, for him to stop chasing you and coming after you with the gift of freedom that comes when you follow him. Into our story, chapter 14. While in Bethany, eating at a man's house known as Simon the leper, you have to wonder if this is someone who Jesus had healed at one time. A woman comes in with an alabaster jar or, or a marble jar, and she breaks it open and anoints Jesus with, with pure nard, which was an expensive perfume that would have been more than, worth more than a year's wages if sold. And the others present, the men with, with Jesus, who was at the table with him, they, they were annoyed at this woman, that this woman used this perfume in this way. They thought it would have been better used to sell it and, and use it for their ministry of, of, of helping the poor. But Jesus accepts this gift. And he alludes once again to, to the idea, to the fact that he's going to be dying soon as he says that this perfume was a symbol to prepare his body for burial. And he goes on to say that wherever this story of this, wherever the gospel is preached, the story of this woman will be told as well. This, however, was the last straw for Judas Iscariot. As this, as Judy, Judas, Judas, excuse me, Judas held the money. He was... He held the money, and he saw that this money, this perfume, could have held, helped their, their money bag, their, their, their treasury. And this is the last, stop, last straw for Judas. And he goes to the chief priests to betray him. The chief priests were excited to, to finally have an inside connection to Jesus. And they promised Judas money in exchange for his help. As we mentioned last week, this journey to Jerusalem was leading up to the last days of Passover. And on the first day of the, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples asked Jesus where they should make preparations to, to, to have the Passover meal. And so he tells two of his disciples to go into Jerusalem and find a man carrying a jar of water. And that they're supposed to follow him. And when, they, when the man gets to a house, there will be an upper room there. And that's going to be the place for them to, to make their preparations for the, the Passover meal. Now, Jerusalem's a big city, so how would you know which man to follow who's carrying this jar of water? It would be the only man carrying a jar of water, as this was considered women's work. This had been a signal for Jesus as he had made preparations ahead of time where women were the ones carrying jars of water, his signal was to have this man carrying the jar of water. So the disciples go into town, they find the man who leads them to the upper room, and they go ahead with the preparations for the Passover meal. And when evening came, he went into the city and arrived at the upper room. Now why wait till evening? Anywhere that Jesus went during the daytime, large crowds gathered. So one of the reasons for waiting till evening would be so that they could go under cover of darkness and it could, he could just be with, with himself and his, 12, his core 12 disciples. And traditionally, the Passover was held in the evening as well. So there's two, two things at work there. Now, if you put yourself in first century Jerusalem for this message today, and you think that a man carrying a jar of water is different. What Jesus does next with the Passover meal is completely off script. First off, it's the 12 disciples and Jesus. Typically, the Passover meal would have been celebrated with their family, not with a, a side group of friends. And we know at least Peter was married, so he was taking this Passover meal away from his family to be with Jesus and the disciples. And Jesus starts off the meal by stating that one of them would betray him. You know what it's like 
when someone you love deeply, maybe they take you out to coffee because they have some, something they need to talk with you about, and they drop some news on you, some bad news or heavy news, something deep and personal, your heart can drop, right? You want to make sure that, that they know that you're there to support them, and we tell them that it's going to be okay. And the, this is often our response, and this was the response for the disciples as well. And a chorus of allegiance rose up from the disciples. I won't betray you, teacher. Surely not I. I will always be with you. I won't leave you. And so on. And Jesus replies that it is one of you in this room who will betray me. And he again gives them a glimpse of what's to come when he says, the Son of Man will go just as it is written. And knowing Judas' heart, he gives him a bit of a last warning should it change his mind about his betrayal. Although Jesus knew this needed to happen and that it was the way it was supposed to happen. As Jesus says, woe to the man who betrays the Son of Man. It would have been better for him if he had not been born. Verse 22. So they're eating this Passover meal and, and moving through different steps in the meal. And Jesus takes the bread. And he gives thanks and, and he breaks the bread and gives it to his disciples. Now the bread was to remember the unleavened bread that they used during that first Passover meal in Egypt. But Jesus goes off script. He says, take and eat. This is my body. Well, that's new. What does he mean by this is my body? And then he takes the cup. And he gives thanks. And they pass it around the table. And after they had all drank from the cup, Jesus says, this is the blood of my covenant, which is poured out for many. Blood of the covenant. What, is, what does blood of the covenant mean? They already have a covenant. The Jewish people already, with Abraham and the Sinai covenant, they already have covenants. What does he mean by blood of the covenant? And the disciples wouldn't connect the dots until later. That these new symbols were the symbols of a new covenant being made and a promise fulfilled to the father of Israel. When God had promised Abraham that not only would he be a great nation, but that his nation would be a blessing to all nations. That promise would be fulfilled. Jesus was the sacrificial lamb, his body broken, his blood spilled, just as the prophets foretold. And Jesus goes on to tell the disciples that he will not drink of the vine again until he drinks it anew with them in, the fa in his father's kingdom. And then Jesus tells them that they will all fall away. Just as it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. And he tells them again that it won't be the end. His death is not the end. As he says, I will rise again. He spells all of this out for them, but they just don't get it. And he says when he arises, he will go ahead of them to Galilee. And Peter, the rock, the one who's always steadfast, says even if all of the others fall away, look. I will not. And Jesus goes on to predict specifically when Peter will be reminded of this very conversation. As Jesus says, this very night before the rooster crows twice, you will disown me three times. And you can imagine sitting in that room with Peter as he tells this part of the story to Mark. Knowing now what he didn't know at the time in that upper room. There was a solemn, a sadness in Peter's voice. As he knew what Jesus said in that upper room would come true. And after that strange Passover meal, one like, unlike any they had ever had before. They moved to a place called Gethsemane. 
And Jesus tells the disciples to, to wait here as he goes off and pray. And like he often does, he takes, he takes Peter, James, and John with them a little bit further. And Peter notes Jesus becoming distressed and troubled. You can tell when someone's distressed, right? Or stressed to the max. When something's heavy on, weighing heavy on their mind. Their body language shifts. Shoulders get heavy. Tone in their voice shifts. And Jesus says, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch. And going a little further, Jesus, knowing what was coming this very night, falls to the ground and prays, Abba, Father, Daddy, Everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me. Yet not what I will, but what you will. He spends time in prayer and he goes back to the disciples to find them sleeping. His friends that he had asked to help keep watch. Sleeping. He says, Simon, are you sleeping? Couldn't you stay awake with me one hour? Watch and pray that you won't fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. Jesus, being 100% God, was willing to do what needed to be done. But Jesus, being 100% human, and knowing the pain, the torture, the loneliness that was going to come. He longed for there to be another way. And Jesus goes away again and he prays. And he comes back to find Peter and James and John asleep again. And a third time he goes off to pray and and then Luke twenty two forty four says that he was so deep in prayer and his body so tired and burdened, knowing what would come, that his sweat was like drops of blood. Jesus returns a third time, and same story, he finds them asleep. This time, though, the hour had come. His betrayer, Judas, coming toward them with the crowd armed with swords and clubs, they were sent from the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders. Judas walks up to, G Judas, to Jesus, says, Rabbi, and greets him with a kiss, the signal to the crowd for who to arrest. And the men seize Jesus, and we know from the Gospel of John that Peter takes out his sword and cuts off the ear of the servant of the high priest. And the Gospel of Luke tells us that Jesus touched the man's ear and healed him. You can, emerge, you can imagine that servant of the high priest, his story changed that night. And then Jesus asked the crowd, Do you think I'm leading a rebellion that you have come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I was with you in the temple courts. You could have arrested me then. Why this way? But the scriptures must be fulfilled. And with these words, everyone deserted him and fled. Do you know how many everyone is? All of them. Everyone who was with Jesus deserted him and fled. These same men who just a few hours before proclaimed their allegiance to him and affirmed that they would always stay loyal and stay by his side. And even Peter, who said, even if all the others fall away, I will remain with you. And he did not. Not Peter's most proud moment, but part of the story that he knew he needed to tell 
as it would be so important in understanding the love and grace that can only come from God. The arresting crowd, they, they take Jesus to the high priest, the chief priest, the elders, and the teachers of the law. And Peter follows at a distance in the shadows, not to be seen. And he goes, follows them right into the courtyard of the high priest. And he watches from a distance as, as the temple leaders question Jesus. And Peter remains silent. And as people bring testimonies that weren't true, and Peter could have corrected, and he remains silent as he warms himself by a fire. Their stories that they were telling about Jesus didn't even match up. But that didn't matter. They were searching for anything they could to get rid of Jesus. And the high priest and those gathered grew more and more frustrated as they were asking Jesus and throwing these testimonies at Jesus. And he remained silent. Could we do that? How often do we feel the need when somebody says something about us or, or something's happening on, on social media, we feel the need to defend who we are. We feel the need to put ourselves out there and let everybody know that I'm this way. Jesus remains silent. There's no need for him to defend himself or his reputation, his life was his defense. So he stays silent until the high priest asks him the one question he knew he needed to answer. Are you the Christ, the son of the blessed one? I am. And you will see the son of man sitting at the right hand of the mighty one and coming on the clouds of heaven. And with that, they had him. To claim to be the son of God was against the rules. <laughs> it was against what, the, what was written in the law and the prophets. It was blasphemy. And they had him. And they condemned him to death. And they spit on him like he said they would. And they blindfolded him, and they struck him with their fists, like he said they would. And the guards took him, and they beat him some more, like he said they would. And Peter, still in the courtyard, is recognized and called out. You were with him. But Peter denies it. He says, I, I don't know what you're talking about. In a second time, this, this man is one of them, speaking about, the, who, speaking about them being as the disciples of Jesus. And again, he denies it. And I wonder if, if Mark, as he's hearing Peter tell these stories, tell this story, maybe stops writing pulled into the pain in Peter's voice and the tears welling in his eyes as Peter recounts a third time being called out as one of Jesus' disciples and a third time denying it as he called out curses down and swore to them, I don't know this man that you're talking about. And immediately, right in that moment, the words barely out of his mouth, the rooster crows a second time. And Peter's cloudy mind, full of a blur of, of an evening that's in fast forward, yet in slow motion at the same time, remembers the words of Jesus. 
Before the rooster crows twice, you will disown me three times. And Peter broke down and wept. And I bet he did again as he tells this story to Mark one last time. Chapter 15. The temple leaders had made their decision. And they bound Jesus and handed him over to Pilate. Now blasphemy wasn't a charge that Pilate would have bothered with. Not a big deal for him. So they changed the wording a bit so Pilate would would take this claim a bit more seriously. And so they brought Jesus before Pilate and said that he was claiming to be a king. Now this was a term that Pilate took a little more seriously. And so Pilate asks Jesus, Are you the king of the Jews? Yes. It is as you say, Jesus replies. And then the chief priests, like they did in their own temple courts, lay on more accusations. And Jesus, doing again what he did in those temple courts, remains silent. And so Pilate asks him, Are you not going to answer these questions, answer these things? Are you not going to respond to the things they accuse you of? Jesus makes no reply, and Pilate is amazed. Why is this amazing? Pilate's used to when people come before him under trial. As people bring accusations against people as they they come before him under trial. Pilate's used to people just hitting the floor, begging and pleading with him to free them, defending themselves against the accusations before them. He's used to people submitting to his power and the freedom that he could potentially give them. But Jesus remains silent. And Jesus makes no reply. Pilate sees another way to, for, to, 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 excuse me, for potentially releasing Jesus. He too is likely aware of, of the parade just a few days earlier that, that had brought Jesus into town. He knew that the only reason Jesus was here before them was was because the temple leaders were jealous of him and were trying to find a way to get rid of him. And he knows the crowd, because of this these parades, love Jesus, right? It was custom during the Passover time for Pilate to release a Jewish citizen that he had had in custody. And so he gives the people a choice. Barabbas, a Jewish zealot who who had committed murder during an uprising. Or Jesus, who really hadn't done anything wrong, just made a few people jealous. So he leaves it up to the crowd. And the priests stir up the crowd. And they shout for the release of Barabbas. Well, what should I do with the one you call the king of the Jews? Crucify him. Crucify him? What crime has he committed? But the crowd just shouted all the louder, Crucify him! And wanting to satisfy the crowd, being a people pleaser himself, Pilate releases Barabbas, and he sends Jesus to be flogged and then crucified. The soldiers mock him and beat him and they press a crown of thorns into his head. And after they beat him, they put his clothes back on him and they lead him out to crucify him. And with Jesus being being weak from his beatings and struggling to be able to carry the weight of the cross, up the hill 
the soldiers pull a man from the crowd and they force Simon of Cyrene to carry the cross for Jesus. And they brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, the place of the skull. <laughs> this was not a happy place. The only time people came to this hill was for a time of death. And one little verse, and they crucified him. No more details were given. As at the time of this writing, if you put yourself back in first century Jerusalem, the persons reading this testimony of Peter through the hand, through the through the written words of Mark, had likely all witnessed a crucifixion at some time already in their lives. No more details were needed when Peter told this story to Mark. It's a phrase we read and then we move past so quickly because we don't understand. Crucifixion? You don't survive that. That terrible, agonizingly long torturous death. And those below Jesus' cross, they cast lots for his clothes. And they hung a sign on his cross with the charge against him, the King of the Jews. And they mocked him, save yourself. Come down from the cross. Maybe Elijah will come and save you. Why don't you call forth some angels to get you off of the cross? Jesus could have. He could have called down angels to save himself and to destroy all of the people that put him there. But he didn't. He stayed on the cross for the people that put him there. It was for the it was the third hour when they hung Jesus on that cross. And in the sixth hour, darkness covers the whole land. And in the ninth hour, Jesus cried out, Eloi, Eloi, lama sachbentani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And God the Father did. Can you even imagine what God the Father must have been going through in that moment? If a child cries out in pain, or is sick, or cries out with a desperate, Daddy, help me! What do we do? We're at their side in an instant doing whatever we can do to help them feel better, to heal them, to bring comfort, to bring peace to our child. But God left his son there to die for his people, to die for the people who put him there. To die for the people who knew him, but had lost their faith when he was arrested and put up on the cross. To die for those who had no understanding of who he was, but heard about him later. To die for you and for me. How can this not change us? And with a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last breath. And in that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn from top to bottom. The curtain that separated where God dwelled from the people. 
this curtain was no longer needed. And when the centurion who stood in front of Jesus heard his cry and saw how he had died, he said, surely this man was the son of God. And where were his disciples? Gone. Scattered. Hiding. Everything they had held their faith to was lost, was hanging on a cross. Their king was dead, and so was their faith. If this is you today, if you thought you knew Jesus at one point, but for some reason or another, you've lost your faith, or you've stepped away and you find yourself here today. Or if you were brought by a friend or for some reason you, you found us online and you're joining us today and this whole Jesus thing is new. If this is you, I encourage you to come back next week. Jesus did this for you. That your faith may have a deeper depth and a deeper understanding with a new love that has, has gone through the depths that only death can bring. And as Peter will tell us next week, and as we hear from the four Gospels, from the testimony in the four Gospels, and from Paul and Peter and the rest of the New Testament, this story isn't over. It's just the beginning. I invite the praise team to come forward at this time. God loved us so much. He sent his son to show us a new way. To teach and to love. And to understand the depths of his love for his people, which are all people that he created. And to die a terrible death on a cross. So that whoever believes in him will never perish. Yeah, our bodies will perish at some point. But we will never perish as we live with him in eternity. He took this on for you. Join us as we sing one last song.
shall come with shout of acclamation and lead me home what joy shall fill my heart then I shall How are our souls singing today? As we depart today, let us depart with souls that are filled with a joy that comes through this story that we just heard this morning, through the testimony of this song that we just sang. How great is our God that He would send His Son to do what He did. And how great is his love that our hearts might be filled with joy that as we leave here today is going to resonate throughout our communities. And people are going to look at you and they're going to say something's different. And they want a little piece of that joy too. Let us go ready to be stewards of God's love into our community around us. Let it shift the way that we think. Let it impact the words that we say, that we speak differently. And let it impact our actions, that everything about us is love. Amen. You may be seated.